Thanks, everybody. And uh, go back here. Thank you. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here today, and, and thanks to ABEARS for uh, inviting me. If you have a look there, that's where I live, um, and that's a rice paddy, and there's about a steady four centimetres of water right across that, um, about 28 hectares of rice. And our plan is to uh, deliver that. That's paddy rice, and um, that went about 12 tonnes per hectare, um, which is a high yield on world standards. And uh, we got a great lot of pressure out of doing that, and that's where I do it, up at a place called Moulamine. Um, that's part of the Murray Irrigation Limited Scheme. And uh, basically, I'd just like to describe, before I sort of get into the nuts and bolts of um, the basin plan and how it, I feel it's going to affect me and what the outcomes were, are, um, just describe what the operation is. Um, I operate uh, eight Murray Irrigation Holdings. Um, this year I've got 720 hectares of rice in, it's ready to harvest and when I go home on Tuesday I'm going to hook into it. I hope to get 7,000 tonnes of paddy, uh, but you never know until you put that header in there. Um, we've harvested about 1,500 uh, tonne of wheat, barley and peas from the residual moisture from our rice crops. So, so basically we're in a very fortunate position that we have a residual moisture after we've harvested the rice and we use that moisture to, um, to grow more crop. Also do about uh, 1,200 fat lambs, and to do all that, uh, there's myself, my two sons, and, uh, and one full-time employee. Now, we use a lot of water, and uh, it's hard for people to comprehend what we do use, and I'll try and describe it. So, um, to grow those crops and finish the cereal crops, I've used 9,400 megalitres of water. Um, of that, I've got entitlements that generated 4,600 megalitres. Uh, from, that's entitlement yield. And um, on the temporary market, I purchased another 4,800 megalitres. And when I say that's a lot of water, um, that's 9 billion, uh, 400 million uh, litres of water. And just as a bit of an anecdote, the age about, oh, about 10 years ago wrote, shock horror, we must get rid of the rice industry. They are using uh, 1.7 billion litres of water. And at the time, it was in an editorial, and I thought, should I tell them that, in fact, the figure is 1.7 trillion litres, or should I just leave it alone? <laughs> so I just left it alone. Um, so we generate fairly me well, not meagre, but just fairly average broad acre returns, about 240 megalitres uh, dollars per megalitre. Uh, and, you know, that has caused people to say, you know, compared to returns on horticulture, et cetera, what are you doing? I think the thing that sort of escaped a lot of people's observation is that um, that amount of rice and cereals will feed, for a year, 90,000 people. So, you know, in terms of returns, uh, it's, it's not great, but it's, it's, a good, um, it's a good healthy farm business we have, but we use a lot of water resources and we don't walk away from that, but we feed a heck of a lot of people. When I have water, um, we run the farm, we uh, basically, uh, I've purchased with my brother while he was with us, uh, the farms we've got and uh, bought a you know, run down cheap farms because they're cheap and we've redeveloped them. So what we basically do is, um, that's an example of a miserable old 1960s layout. You can see the windy old contours and that piece there used to take me about 200 megalitres of water to water, it used to take me about uh, two weeks to do it. Um, that's it now, and you can see it's been whole farm planned, it's been surveyed. I do all the surveying myself. You can hire a bit of satellite gear for about two grand and you go and take about 16,000 shots. And uh, you'll see up here we've got a recirculation dam. It's all lasered to high tolerance, and uh, that piece there is the same as that. So that piece there now, that used to take me two weeks to water and 200 megalitres, I can do that in seven days, and I can use about 130 megalitres. So that's where we get uh, irrigation efficiency. Um, we use GIS for GIS um, ArcView for data management, just to help us run us all the things. Uh, we get satellite images while the crop's growing, and uh, to get, and so that's a measure of how well the crop's growing. Then we use that to generate um, yield maps, uh, not yield maps, application maps, and then we use uh, differential application that fertilizer because we 
try to limit the nitrogenous fertiliser we put on. If we don't need it, we don't need it. Um, then we go and harvest it, which is a pleasant experience and I'm looking forward to doing that. And we generate a yield map, so that's the same piece. And you can see the variability you get in, in a crop of land, so uh, it's quite extraordinary. Now we'll use that, we're developing about 10 years of data now, and we'll use that to um, fine tune how we, we operate all that country. So I want to address now the old um, rice in Australia argument. And for example, some people and politicians quite blatantly say that if rice and cotton are still being grown in this basin, at the end of the basin plan, you know, the whole thing's failed. I disagree. Um, and to give you an example, what has happened is, you know, we've got various levels of um, crop in, we've got our permanent plantings that are a long-term um, investment. You can't switch off in a drought. During the last severe drought, we actually switched all the rice production off in Australia. And when I say all, well, our crop was down to 2% of normal plantings. Now, any small amounts of water we had that we were allocating, it was only a little bit, went to horticulture, and manage to keep that going. So I say that the uh, Australian rice industry is the buffer for the basin in times of extreme drought. The other thing we say is, uh, and it's not just me saying it, the Australian rice growers are the world's most efficient rice growers and we hold a world record average for all the crops grown in Australia in excess of 10 tonnes per hect hectare as a national average. Um, a typical yield in, in uh, Asia is three and a half tonnes, four tonnes. And uh, the other thing is if, you know, if we have governments determining what we're going to grow, governments have a very poor record everywhere around the world of picking agricultural winners. So now I get to the, the purpose of the, um, of the speech, but I just want to sort of fill you in a little bit with what we do. Um, one of the tough things for Rhonda and her team is that uh, all the ills of the basin are laid at, of the, you know, the water reform process and They've all been laid at the, at the feet of, the, ba of the, uh, the authority and the basin plan. And a good example of that is when uh, the predecessors, uh, Mike Taylor and Rob Freeman, were addressing a meeting in, in Daniloquin. And uh, I know that one of our parliamentarians, Susan Lee, was actually pointing and speaking very loudly and quite aggressively to them at the, up in the stage. And I was thinking to myself, well, I thought you were actually the Parliamentary Secretary for Water while they were develop developing the bill, so um, they really copped it and I think, you know, it's sad to see two capable people like that actually, I think basically they fell on their swords. So what we've got there is we've got 20 years of uh, water reform that's culminated in the plan. We had the cap on diversions uh, in 1995 and prior to that period I basically had all the water I wanted. I'd start with a 130% allocation announcement. I'd get uh, off-allocation water, then I'd get retrospective off-allocation water. If I used my 130%, I could get 30% of overdraw and if fumes spilt, uh, everything was fine. So had limitless water, but I think we all appreciated that couldn't go on forever. Uh, then we went to the state water sharing plans in New South Wales in 2004, and we thought we'd finally got to the end of the process. That wasn't the end of the process. Um, we went through separation of land and water, we went through water markets developing and, and we, we called out for water markets too and, and for reasons we'll show you. Then we had the Living Murray and there were suggestions that it could be a thousand uh, gigalitres, sorry, a, a thousand gigalitres go to, uh, to the environment. We were horrified. So it's all culminated in the basin plan and as Rhonda's pointed out, when you go to public meetings, the vast majority, and I hate to say this, but I think the vast majority do not understand it and say, all this stuff that's going on that's confused me and disappoints me, that's their fault. And so it's a tough, it's pretty tough. But anyway, I'm sure you're up to it. Um, now I'm going to say here what irrigators were told, but I probably should say what we thought we were told. So I'll just clear that one up. Um, lack of flows in the South Australian la uh, lakes was symptomatic of uh, the degradation in the Murray-Darling Basin. And look, we can see things out there in our, in our, in our farms. Um, the state caps, as I said, and uh, you know, the Living Murray process, they weren't enough. We had to go further. Uh, in New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland, we're just using too much water in broadacre uh, irrigation. And that science would establish a range of risk-based solutions to guide a political decision. And I think it's important that it, it's going to be a political decision because it's not for science to work out how we're going to adjust society. That's the politician's job and they've got to stand up there and take it. So um, also, the other important thing was the concept where ir ir individual irrigators could choose to stay the same, not in 
participate in any of the schemes or, or the return of water, but they're going to have less active neighbours. Uh, the pain would be shared across the basin and uh, water reform would equip us to deal with change. Now I'm going to say what seems to happen, and this is just my view of sitting back and look, talking to neighbours, etc. Um, I've got, my neighbours are still there, but many have sold all or some of their water. And when you think of that, it's better than somebody getting loaded out by the sheriff. So some, some of my neighbours don't actually irrigate anymore, but they're still there and they're still in the community. So that's plus and minus. Um, the water market continues to be all important. I cannot operate an irrigation farm without the water market. Um, I've worked out, and I think my neighbours worked out, we've got a reasonably secure property right. And where that's important is that, you know, we only have to go back 10 years ago where we were talking about, you know, compulsory acquisition, across the board cuts, um, and that was going to be a bad situation. Um, I'm going to use this term, risk assignment has been deemed to be unworkable. Now probably there wouldn't be many of you would know what risk assignment is, and I don't think any New South Wales legislator, I just think that's one of the things that people haven't been able to grasp, and that's the concept of as things change, who bears the risks? And there was you know, division between government and irrigators, but I've got to say that appears to have defaulted to closing the gap, which is a term where governments are picking up that change. And so if you want to roll that back, and I know it's part of your, your brief to deal with risk assignment, you've got a bit of a challenge there now, I think. Um, the relationship between the states and the MDBA, it appears it's in danger of falling apart, which to us concerns us because uh, things that need to be done won't be done and we won't get the reforms we need. So that concerns us and I hope everybody sort of steps back a little bit and looks at it. Um, the other concern to us that you might appreciate, the Commonwealth Environmental Water Holder now holds a big parcel of water. So that's really imposed a layer of, un of dis not disinformation, but a, a layer of fog as I've got it written there about the question we start each season with is, I'm going to plan in October, I hope I've got enough water, my allocation's still building, I hope I've got enough water to finish the crop. If I haven't, I'm going to have to go into the market. So at this stage, we don't know what, how the Commonwealth Environmental Water Hold is going to deal with his block of water in the dam, whether he's going to use it, whether he's going to try and build it up. And we've got some pretty firm evidence that it's impacting start of season allocations. Uh, now the positives, governments did not resort to compulsory acquisition or across the board cuts and now that is an enormous positive and uh, it was a great decision from my point of view. And I think when you look at problems around the world, property rights and lack of property rights underpins a lot of agricultural failure. Um, so property rights have been respected, um, water efficiency programs are available. Uh, now I know a lot of really dry economists would tell you they're an abomination and they shouldn't be done and you know if farmers were going to do it they'd do it themselves. But it has put a kick in the steps in the rural regions and people are very serious about investing in infrastructure and processes to improve their water use because they can see that that's the way of the future. And what we all hope, and you mightn't hear it from farmers very much, but we live in a beautiful area, is that we'll get some good river health outcomes. And as another po positive, I'm still going after the drought, so that's been good. Uh, negatives, um, market operations and information are poor. And it's a bit hard for me to say that because Australian trading in water, it, it, is, it just doesn't happen anywhere else in the world, the way we do it. And I believe it's a good system, so I'm being a bit hard, but um, and when I say it doesn't operate, what will happen now is I want to buy 300 megalitres of temporary water, then I'll go and see a broker. I'll give you, hand him over a fairly large cheque. Uh, check. He'll go and try and source water. He'll sit on it for about 30 days and somebody will try and transfer it into state and eventually I'll get it and then eventually I might be able to use it. Meanwhile, the crop's half dead. So not working well. Um, then the other problem we have, governments continue to intervene in markets. They can't help themselves. And, you know, just a recent example is, uh, it sounds strange, but um, we had the Victorian spill account for Dartmouth. Now, Dartmouth's a very slow filling dam. So all the water in there was suspended because they couldn't work out whether it was actually going to spill or not going to quite spill. And that had quite a profound impact on the market because about 1.3 million megalitres water was all tied up. 
So I got the market wrong. I thought it was going to get cheaper, and it got a damn sight dearer. And as you know, I bought 4,500 megalitres. So, um, so these are concerns. Um, and also, there's a, a, a real feel out there that people aren't finished with us yet. Uh, these, these reforms haven't concluded. You know, we look at the, the 2016 adjustment of the SDLs, and look, I've read it and we feel, but we've just got a nagging feeling in the back of our heads that, you know, we, we're in for it. But let's have some faith, but it's a concern. And um, the other thing is communities that are used to outcomes with farms and accountability for using water and um, we're unable to, we feel we're going to be unable to benchmark whether the basin plan outcomes worked out. So, um, so was it all worth it? Did we get the environmental improvement? Because you know, just from a, an irrigation farmer's point of view, more water on the farm doesn't always work out. If you waterlogged the back uh, 60 acres, you just destroyed the back 60 acres. So, you know, the, and some farmers are terrific at using water and some are woeful at using water. So, so there's going to be a range of uh, abilities to use it. So that's, that's a concern. Um, now, what I'd like to see is um, the MDBA connect more with irrigators. And I hate to shift people around, but I think if we could entrench people, maybe, I don't care, Mildura, Albury, um, Renmark. Mildurine. Probably not Mildurine. <laughs> Might be a bit of a tough figure out there. Uh, it would be good. Um, what I'd like to see is measurable targets when the water, water plans come out. Even if you get them wrong, I'd like to see some measurable targets where we might even put some species numbers and some benchmarking and whether we, we actually achieve that. And if we fail, let's try another wetland and do something. So um, another thing I'd like to see is ensure that watering plans and their potential, ensure watering plans and their potential impacts are available to water market participants. So. Um, also, I think we've got e-water and we've got market water. And there are going to be times with, and I know at this stage, you know, the, it's a complicated connection, you know, that it's held by the Commonwealth Environmental Water Holder, the Murray-Darling Basin Authority. So there's a lot of people involved of how this is going to be rolled out in state water. But at some stage, these, uh, whoever's controlling the water, every 20 years will have a chance to make a massive amount of money out of that water. Um, now you could say, but they're the years when we actually want to use it for environmental benefit. But one of the good things that's been happening out there in the regions is, is investment in ways to deliver water to environmental wetlands uh, in an efficient manner. So I think um, if the uh, environmental water uh, holder is seen to be more, you know, quite accountable for the value of that water, the outcomes they get, and to have some flexibility of approach rather than just going to, to Treasury and saying we need more water. Anyway, I think that would be a positive. So uh, my first talk to ABEA was in 1997 where we just created a fledgling water exchange in the Murray-Darling Basin. And how it used to work is I applied for some water off the Horticultural Council. And I rang them up in a tender and said, did I get some water? They said, no, you didn't. How much did I miss out by? I can't tell you that. What did water go for? Can't tell you that. How much water was sold? Can't tell you that. So we went back from that and we started the, uh, the water exchange. That's now run by Murray Irrigation. And uh, what we, as irrigation farmers now, we are unable to operate without efficient water markets. That sets our whole program for the entire year. We need our water allocation markets to be, to be real time. And I've heard countless times that that's just too hard. For example, a good reason is we have to send people out to remote areas to read the meter to see if they've actually got any water to trade. Well, I'd like to see state and government, state governments and federal agencies be bold. They still control whether water's allocated the next year, whether you've got penalties. So I'd like to really, that needs to be the target. But it's not just up to government, it's also up to irrigation infrastructure operators. Now, they hold a gold mine in the shape of a bulk allocation. So if a group like Murray Irrigation Hole has a million megalitres sitting on its, on its licence and a group like um, Western Murray or Sunlands in South Australia are holding 60,000 megalitres, if it takes the, uh, the interstate authorities a, a month to transfer and do the transfers, 
doesn't really matter, except in a few unique situations. They know they'll get the water. So by just going to um, heads of agreements between the major irrigation corporations, we could go very quickly to probably 70% of the trade, 80% of the trade to real-time standards immediately. So there's a bit of an onus on us as irrigators to, to get something happening as well. Now, that there is up on the Kimberleys, and that's a rice crop I grew two years ago. And the reason, what's that got to do with the Murray-Darling Basin? Well, I think it's important to reflect, it's been valuable for me to reflect on what, what do we have with the Murray-Darling Basin? And uh, why is it, why does it work so well? Why is it such a, you know, a production powerhouse? Um, because you, you've all have heard that we're going to turn the north into a food bowl and it's all going to happen. Um, and it could, I'm not saying it couldn't. Um, so we were able to grow you know, some beautiful rice crops up there. It grows well. didn't actually have the varieties that we probably needed. So that's the second crop about to be harvested. And unfortunately, I'll just show you up here, those spots there uh, in August, that's called rice blast. And so that's an exotic disease. It's, uh, it's a category two incursion and it's sort of one down from foot and mouth, so uh, that triggered a uh, full interstate panel of uh, quarantine to work out what they were going to do. Now, we knew what they were going to do. After six weeks of fiddling around, they were going to tell us that you're on your own, boys. So look after yourselves. And that's, in fact, that's what happened. So unfortunately for that, the Murray-Darling Basin is the last place in the world not to have rice blast. They've got it in Japan, uh, California. So that was pretty well the death knell on the operation. So, uh, but it wasn't all bad. Um, that was the time of the, uh, of the cattle, uh, cessation of the cattle trade. So there were a lot of cattle in uh, yards that needed feeding. So we cut it all for, um, for hay and they loved it. So, for that, okay. so lessons from the north, um, the Ord has Lots of water. There's masses of water. It's beautiful. It's clean. It's a wonderful thing. It has great warm, dry seasons, uh, and it has some irrigation infrastructure. The ore doesn't have a critical mass. And what I mean by that is just not enough happening. There's just only little bits of crop grown, and they tend to be focused on on shipping it down to the eastern states or down to to uh, Western Australia. And you think, oh, well, Western Australia's not. You know, Perth's not far away. No, it's only 3,200 kilometres. It's a long way. Um, you know, the Port of Wyndham's winding down. I know they're going to spend a bit of money on it. The Port of Wyndham's winding down. So the first crop we did, we actually got containers in there, but it was, you know, because they had to be dropped off and then picked up, so there's no activity there, so that was a big cost. And um, one of the troubles up there with the mining up there, you know, any man that can steer wants, you know, 35 bucks an hour to, to drive a tractor. So the cost, there's a very, a lot of pressure on cost structures. Also... New ventures, you know, face a production risk, uh, including exotic diseases, I found out to my detriment, and also some severe wildlife pressure. I have three brolgas that visit me in the south, which I love those birds, but I didn't love the, 75, the 7, uh, 750 brolgas that visited me uh, while I was on the ord. Uh, yeah. so, um, so, in conclusion, developing the north isn't just about building a new dam, it's about putting it all together. And that's in fact what we've done in the Murray-Darling Basin. We've put together you know, an agricultural powerhouse that can deliver, can feed this country, can feed another 20, 30 million overseas. So just in conclusion, uh, the Murray-Darling Basin is Australia's primary agricultural asset and if the Murray-Darling Basin Authority can successfully implement the Basin Plan, distant generations will continue to enjoy, enjoy its bounty. So um, thank you very much for your time.